All right, everyone, welcome to the DDPS seminar. Uh, before we introduce um, our invited speaker, let's go over uh, some rules and logistics uh, today. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself uh, during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A at the end. Uh, second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, therefore no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel, that's about it. Now, now let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host uh, Petros Umuchakos, uh, who is a Herbert uh, Winokur a Junior Professor of the Engineering and Applied Science Faculty director, director of the Institute of Applied Computational Science and Department of uh, Chair of Applied Mathematics at Harvard University. He studied naval architecture for his master's degree at uh, University of Michigan, aeronautics and applied mathematics for PhD at Caltech, and has served as the Chair of Computational Science and ETH Zurich uh, from to, uh, 1997 to 2020. Petros is elected fellow of the American Society of Mechanical uh, Engineering, the, uh, the American Physics Society, and uh, uh, the Society of Industry, Industrial and Applied Mathematics. He is recipient of the Advanced uh, Investigator Award by the European uh, Research Council and the ACM Golden Bell Prize um, in Supercomputing. He is elected international member to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. His research interests are on the fundamentals and applications of computing and artificial intelligence to understand, predict, and optimize fluid flows in engineering, nanotechnology, and medicine. Today, Petros will give a talk about artificial intelligence and scientific computing for fluid mechanics. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Petros by asking our usual questions. Uh, the question is, what is your favorite things to do during the weekend? <laughs> Working these days, that's my favorite thing. Oh, uh, even during okay, the weekend. If I have to answer yeah. something else, let's say uh, mm -hmm. photography. I like to take pictures. Oh, that's awesome. All right, that sounds fun. Okay, the stage is yours, Petros. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yung Shu. Um, and thank you very much for having me. I. I have great memories uh, about my collaborations with colleagues from Lawrence Livermore National Lab because it's uh, together uh, with people from LLNL that we won the Gordon Bell Prize that you mentioned back in 2013. So, um, so I'm going to tell you actually some of the uh, adventures that I have had over the last uh, uh, few decades on, on the interface of artificial intelligence and scientific computing. And the playground that I have been having is fluid mechanics, but you will see perhaps applications in uh, some other uh, domains. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who have been instrumental uh, in, in this work. Uh, now they're in different uh, places uh, and times of their lives, but they have been uh, very much instrumental to all the things that I will be presenting um, uh, here. So, um, so talking about computers, uh, these are some of the computers that I had the chance to uh, um, to, uh, to work on over the um, time that I started. I started back in 1981. That's when I went into the university in, in Athens, Greece. And these are some of the uh, latest uh, computers that we had the chance to do some of our computations. And the interesting thing here is that there is a tremendous amount of uh, increase in performance uh, that I, a ballpark figure can be in the order of 1 trillion X between um, uh, the VAX, uh, the digital VAX machine that I had back then and what is perhaps today the number one um, uh, supercomputer in the top 500. Um, so we have been using uh, this, um, um, these machines and, and here is actually the simulations that uh, were um, responsible for the Gordon Bell Prize in supercomputing in 2013. And, and this was done actually with some uh, colleagues, uh, Scott uh, Furtal and, and um, I, I think um, uh, Schmidt and, uh, no, not, uh, and, and, and Birch and Futral were people that they were from Lawrence uh, Livermore. So 
these were simulations that um, um, uh, ended up improving uh, the time to solution for compressible flows by uh, a factor of 30. We were some of the perhaps first people who ended up doing petaflops uh, and are reaching very high percentage of peak uh, back then in 2013. The simulations at that time, they used about um, 13 trillion uh, computational uh, elements. And then uh, we had also uh, compression uh, using some uh, wavelet um, type of compression, which was 10 to 100x. So there was very heavy computations. And then in 2015, we conducted another computation. Uh, this time we were interested in flow of uh, blood at submicron uh, resolution in millimeter long uh, devices. And here you see uh, some of the blood cells. This is not the biggest uh, simulation that we did. Uh, but here, this was another method. This was not um, finite volume as it was in the previous case. Now, this was a particle method, dissipative uh, particle uh, dynamics. Uh, and then we were trying to find uh, circulating uh, tumor cells. And then again, another record. There were about 13 trillion uh, particles. Uh, there were uh, tens of millions of time steps. Um, and then we were resolving about 1.4 billion RBCs and 0 0.3 milliliters of blood. Uh, this was already seven years ago. I think there's a lot of other things that people do um, over the uh, years with uh, simulations. Uh, but the thing that I have learned from all these uh, simulations is that uh, physics-based models and the computations that we do, they are um, very, very useful. But at the same time, uh, sometimes you may pay a, a heavy uh, computational um, price. Uh, they can be very expensive. So this is some of the computations that people like myself have been doing in, uh, uh, in scientific computing. But the general public perhaps became aware of the power of computers when computers started to beat humans in more human-like endeavors, like uh, beating humans in the game of chess, in the game of Go, and even in, in uh, the game of, of, of poker. And of course, there is all these activities that are taking place about um, artificial intelligence is everywhere, particular techniques like reinforcement learning, you find um, every, every month, you find either the cover of a famous journal or something in Twitter that gets uh, thousands of likes and, and retweets. Um, so, so there's a lot of excitement of how people are using computers uh, for artificial intelligence. So now what is artificial intelligence? Um, so there is a, a whole bunch of different um, approaches on, and definitions. And I like uh, one of the definitions that was given by Bellman back in 1978, um, where he was talking about the automation of activities that we associate with human thinking, like playing a game, activities such as decision making, problem solving, and, and learning. And there is also another um, uh, definition that I like even more. And this is a definition by John McCarthy, um, the idea is that intelligence is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. Um, so, so this computational ability to achieve uh, specific uh, goals. And the interesting thing is that um, here, the system is most usefully understood, predicted and controlled in terms of outcome uh, rather than its mechanisms. So in a sense, what this um, definition says, you don't necessarily need to know everything about a particular system to understand whether it is intelligent, but you see what the system is, uh, is producing, what is the outcome, and then um, that's a more useful understanding about a particular uh, system. So I will come back to these two um, uh, definitions. So in a sense, we have two different types of computing. Um, so in the things that we do in scientific computing, we take equations and then we translate them into code. And then we use the computer to execute our instructions about exactly what should be done. And now uh, when you are um, doing AI, what you do is you instruct the computer to achieve our goals. So what is the um, goals that we have is we have goals like optimization. So I will try to show you how we can use uh, learning to uh, do optimization. I will discuss how we can do learning for dimensionality reduction. Uh, I will make a, a small foray into a learning to control, and then I'd like to show you some more recent work about learning to predict, and in particular, I'll talk about predicting faster and, um, and better. 
So what does it mean learning to optimize? Um, the problems that we are looking at, if you follow this idea again of artificial intelligence, that you're caring more about outcomes than about mechanisms. The idea is that you have a system that has particular mechanisms, but what you do is you have an input X, and then you are observing the output of the system. So that's a black box scenario as we usually call it. So what you have is you have some data uh, that you are receiving from the system after you're producing uh, a certain input. Um, so this can be in fluid mechanics when you don't have gradients or the gradients are not so useful. Uh, you may have a black box solver, you may have experimental setups, and also in cases that you have multiple local minima and noisy uh, outputs. So how can you learn to solve such problems? Well, the idea um, here is to do an estimation of a probability distribution of um, <coughs> of the points that contain uh, the optimal solution. Uh, this uh, formulation date back to genetic algorithms and evolution algorithms, but with a new twist, the idea is you have some parameters uh, that you are encoding in some, uh, let's say, an initial vector of parameters that we call it parents. And then you have some parameters. These parameters define a probability distribution, and you have to find out these parameters of the probability distribution as you are collecting uh, data, and then uh, when you're collecting uh, data and you're sampling this probability distribution, the cost function that you have determines what should be the offsprings uh, of this uh, evolutionary algorithm. Uh, what is it that you don't know? You don't know how to estimate uh, what is the unknown, where the, the cracks of the matter is what is this probability distribution. These are stochastic algorithms because you need a lot of iterations and a lot of data to estimate the probability distribution of the optimal points. Uh, this is the, the function um, that, uh, that is your black box, and very often uh, you are dealing with expensive cost functions. So here we are learning probability distributions of the optimal points, and here uh, we were learning meta models to replace expensive evaluations in the selection process. So this is work that we did almost now 20 years ago, where we came up with a formulation of how to learn probability distributions and how to integrate uh, meta models together uh, with the way of learning uh, probability distributions. So one of the most powerful methods of estimating probability distributions is a technique called covariance matrix adaptation that I'd like to show you. So imagine that um, you're trying to minimize a function f of x. Um, this, is, this is the function that you have. And then you start in with a guess of a probability distribution that's a Gaussian. So you have a mean and you have a covariance. And then what you do is you are sampling uh, this probability distribution, and then you are collecting, uh, let's say, lambda uh, new points. These are the points that you see here. Now, what you do is you discard the points that they have low fitness. That's where your cost function comes into play. And then you sort and you weigh the points that you have according to the fitness. You see here the size of the circle changes depending on the cost function. Then you recombine um, the points, the good points that you have obtained. And now what you have is you have actually a way of updating uh, the covariance matrix that you initially started, because now you start to have a path inside the parameter space. In a sense, you can see it as starting to do a principal component analysis of the optimal points. And that's actually how you construct the uh, covariance matrix. This technique was originally developed by Nico Hansen, uh, who was a postdoc in our lab, but this is technique that he developed when he was in Berlin. Uh, our contribution, uh, if you like, was that I thought that you can get information not only by doing this rank one update where you are doing only a PCA between the mean points, but you can also use all the points that you have between different generations. And in this way, you have a more general um, update of the covariance matrix. So it's covariance matrix adaptation because you sample a probability distribution and you are learning a covariance matrix on the fly. So the, the technique, um, uh, so it's an, it's a, it's a, it's an iterative technique. Uh, it's uh, parallelizable and, and it has all sorts of good things. And it has been used in, in many things. It can be used in simulation, but it has also been used in, in real experiments, optimizing uh, Formula One cars, optimizing uh, fuel injection rates in turbo machinery, and, and, and many, many applications by ourselves. And also there is a whole bunch of um, different people that are using CMAS. I remember when I first got here, 
I was talking to my colleague Katia Bertoldi, who told me, you know, there is this great optimization method that I found in a software package, and and we are using it, and it's called CMAES, and you should try it. And 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 I told her I have tried this method, uh, and and also there is other colleagues that are using CMAES not only to do things in a computer, but also to do things in 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 a lab. So for example, here Mori has been using it to teach a, a fin to swim properly, and, and he has learned that using an evolutionary algorithm. Another thing that I had done, I had worked, um, uh, that's actually how I started neural nets and machine learning proper. Uh, I was a postdoc at CTR, and I took a course on computational psychology with David Rumelhart of the back propagation algorithm. And the interesting thing was back then, uh, we're talking about 25 years ago, that was the time that in fluid mechanics, if you want to do dimensionality reduction, you had to do the proper orthogonal decomposition. Proper orthogonal decomposition is you get the data, you form a covariance matrix, and you look at eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You retain the ones that you like, and then that's what you have. The question is, what if you don't like what you got? And what if this linear process, how can you take this linear process and make it um, nonlinear? So that's the time that I came across uh, neural networks, and the idea is that you can write equivalently a, a neural net, something that we know perhaps today as an autoencoder, where you can learn the weights of a network that learns the identity mapping. And then there was this beautiful uh, paper by my colleague Kerr Baldi and Kurt Hornig um, uh, that, that actually they proved that uh, you, can, you can show a one-to-one -one correspondence between these neural nets and what happens um, uh, with the POD. And the nice thing about that is that they can, of course, take now the linear things and make it nonlinear by using this principle of architecture. So instead of going into mathematics and doing algebra and things like that, you go into architectures and you're changing um, uh, the weights. So what we, what I was interested at that time was interested of uh, wall turbulence control. Um, so, so here um, you're seeing a flow uh, above a wall in a channel flow. And then uh, what you see, uh, you're looking at different ejection uh, light, uh, like events. And what I was interested at that time, can I, reconstruct this flow um, uh, by using only information uh, from the wall. Um, so at that time, actually, uh, by accident, we were trying to do the reconstruction and to compare, first of all, for any type of a, a vorticity field, the original vorticity field, uh, what you can do with a POD, uh, and then you could compare uh, linear POD with neural nets because you had the one-to-one -one, uh, thing on the amount of weights uh, that you were using except that with the neural nets, you could make them nonlinear and you could make a lot better reconstruction. And I reference that because at that time, actually by accident, we, we did some of the first calculations using deep uh, neural nets. We kept adding layers until we got a, a good solution. The other thing, which was quite a lesson that uh, I learned all along, and I wanna convey the lesson, is we were trying to reconstruct the flow above the wall. This is the U plus, and this is the Y plus of a turbulent channel flow. And we were trying to reconstruct it using wall only information. So the idea is what if I give pressure and vorticity on the wall, can I reconstruct the flow above the wall? And the answer to that was a miserable no. And then at some point I realized, what if I help the neural net? And what if I tell them that to reconstruct the streamwise velocity along the wall. It's good if you know the um, velocity, the vorticity, the spanwise vorticity on the wall, because that depends linearly uh, with the distance above the wall. And also the second derivative of the velocity, actually you can relate it to the vorticity flux and in terms of the pressure gradient. So you help the neural net by telling it what the first two terms in the polynomial should be. And then we gave to the neural net to do the rest of the work. So the solid line is an average uh, velocity profile that we got from a DNS. And this is what maybe uh, you would get, actually, this is what you would get by doing a, a linear uh, POD. And then when you take uh, the second or reconstruction here and put together with a neural net, you will get this dust dot that was a much better reconstruction. And if you were using only the second order, you're already at y plus of three or 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 uh, or, or four. You already lose uh, the accuracy, and here you see actually that the neural net does help you to advance for 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 a little bit of time. 
So at that time, I remember I, I was very excited about machine learning. I even wrote a review article about machine language flow, mo flow modeling and optimization that nobody wanted to publish, uh, except the annual research briefs of CTR from 1999. And one of the reasons that actually this research at that time was quite problematic was if you look at how computers evolved, um, I wrote another review article about machine learning for fluid mechanics more recently. Uh, the speed up of the computer tells the whole story. What takes about three minutes in 2019 to compute, it would have taken about a year in 1997. So, so that's a big, uh, big uh, uh, difference. Now, learning to predict. Um, so, so more recent work uh, where I was interested in looking at different types of data. I was interested in data that are coming out of time series. So I thought I would look into recurrent neural nets and long short term memory um, networks and try to see how can I use uh, LSTMs and recurrent neural nets in order to predict uh, complex systems. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was first introduced to LSTMs when I moved to Switzerland in 1997 because I got to know Jürgen Smithhuber, um, who was the inventor of LSTMs. And we actually together wrote a proposal um, to get some money from the Swiss National Science Foundation about using machine learning for fluid mechanics back then. And, and it was promptly rejected, <laughs> but, but that's what it is. Um, uh, in any case, uh, so, so now this is what we do. Um, so we, I'll show you some examples of predictions on the kuramoto Shivasinski. So here's the kuramoto Shivasinski. Uh, we can discretize it with a finite different scheme. And the question is, can I train uh, a little bit and then try to predict uh, using only recurrent neural nets and forgetting about uh, the uh, equation? So the training data we could choose, uh, they could be high dimensional data. We have all the information we want by solving um, the kuramoto uh, Sivasinski. But then we thought if we wanna have something more practical, we might as well project the high dimensional data to a low dimensional space. And the initial work that we did was to actually project it uh, using the SVD, uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, PCA, whatever you want to call it. So training data are no longer the full description of the of the of the Kuramoto Shivasinski, but we kept 20 SVD modes because this were giving us enough of the total energy for a particular viscosity. So this was actually um, the uh, lower dimensional state, and, and actually this helped us to have easier training because of the memory requirements of the LSTM. So how good is this? Um, so how good is this? Uh, let me show you some results. So here is the some uh, particular case of the kuramoto Shivasinski, and we are using data in this green uh, square. So we're taking data in this green square, and after I'm training in this green square, I want to see what if I switch off after that my training, and then I no longer solve kuramoto Shivasinski, but I'm using my LSTM to predict what's happening further. Okay, important is this. I don't want to interpolate. I want to extrapolate. I want to predict beyond my domain that I have here. So how good are LSTMs? Um, well, um, when you look right after the training, you seem to be getting a very good solution. Um, if you move it to about uh, 0.5 of the training, that you have done, um, it still works quite well. Um, you move it to one time unit, where one time unit is where you were training, you start to see some problems and the system is chaotic. Uh, as soon as you start to have problems, when you try to look at what happens further, you're gonna lose it. So we find that we can predict that for some time, but we cannot uh, forget about the equation because at some point we start to run uh, away uh, from the equation uh, itself, no matter what successes that we may have. So if you want to see uh, the forecasting error that we make, um, you see that as the time progresses, we make higher and higher forecasting error in the modes where we have done the training and also in the uh, reconstruction. So our result was that for some systems, you can predict them up to a certain time. It depends very much on the chaoticity of the system, but the recurrent neural nets and other neural nets that we used are not the solution to predict uh, uh, complex systems. And, and, and I'll show you uh, the effect of chaoticity. So remember the kuramoto Shivasinski has a coefficient that multiplies the fourth order term. Um, this is the prediction are the blue points. The true uh, is the green. And you see that you slowly, as you start to depart from uh, a green, then the system is chaotic. But 
you keep it there for a while, but eventually you start to predict uh, very different uh, things. And here, maybe you can say I have remained within the limit, uh, within the phase space. Uh, you see the things don't go wild, but when you um, reduce the dissipation, um, and then you start to see that you get some really wild uh, discrepancies and, and the systems um, uh, uh, don't, don't seem to be doing a good job. So we're very uh, surprised when we saw a paper in Quanta magazine that said actually that our work, uh, along with other work, show that machine learning has an amazing ability to predict chaos. And all I want to say about that, that um, this paper show you that uh, machine learning does not Perhaps it does not yet, uh, but definitely I think uh, we have to be careful and I think there is exciting times to try to uh, see whether uh, machine learning can predict um, uh, chaotic and complex uh, systems. So, so let's say um, we have problems in trying to predict with machine learning alone. Can we combine now machine learning uh, together with some of the things we do in scientific computing. So the first thing I want to show you is how can we learn to predict, but accelerating what scientific computing can do. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be fancy and, and I'm saying that uh, what I'm doing are alloys, uh, alloys of scientific computing and AI. So the same way as you may have two metals and, and then you can replace one metal with another, or you can intersperse uh, in, uh, some, some metal inside the other metal or you can do all of the above. Uh, you may think that you can have models and numerics, and you may have uh, machine learning tools um, that you are uh, combining, and I call this uh, computing alloys. So let me show you the first alloy. And uh, the first alloy, uh, it's uh, the idea of learning the effective dynamics of complex systems. So this idea is traced back to uh, uh, a person that actually was one of the pioneers in machine learning. Uh, and I think he worked even uh, before myself in this field. This is Yanis Kevrakidis. And Yanis had this wonderful idea of equation-free framework. The idea was that you do some simulations in the micro scales, but because you are uh, running into an expensive uh, code, you cannot afford to run for a long time. So what if you just filter it and you go to a macro scale, and then you advance onto the, the micro scale using some kind of an integrator? And now you cannot afford to stay the whole time on the micro scale point, but then you need to return into the micro scale. That's the lifting operator. And then you iterate. So I always had this idea in my mind. Actually, Yanis introduced me to this idea when he first came up with it in a visit that he just had at ETH. Uh, but I always, there were two things I didn't like. I didn't like the way um, the time uh, propagation was done using standard uh, finite, uh, standard schemes like uh, runge kuta and, and things like that. And I was always puzzled, how do you go from the macro back onto the micro, from less information to more information? So after spending a lot of time uh, traveling around machine learning ideas, I, I thought that, you know what? Uh, we have autoencoders and what the autoencoders do, not only they learn how to go to the latent space, but they also learn how to go back out to the full space. So when you're doing the training of an autoencoder, you're learning to go to the filter space and you go, you use the decoder to go back out into uh, the full space. And from what you show, I know how to integrate um, uh, reduced order spaces using uh, long short term memory recurrent networks. So what if we put these two things together? So I have a macro dynamic propagation, as I just showed you, but I go back and forth between my simulation using uh, restricting and lifting using autoencoders. So what's the idea? The idea now is like that. You have some simulations and then you use the encoder decoder to figure out a latent space. And then you evolve into the latent space using memory and uh, RNNs. And then whenever you need to go out, you use a decoder. Uh, then you evolve again, you update your encoder and decoder, and you go back and forth. And you may see that there is actually two time scales that you have to uh, take into account. There is a micro scale T mu and a macro scale T m. And then you can play with these two different uh, scales in order to decide how much uh, you can or you want to accelerate. So how good is this? Back to Kuramoto-Sivasinski, uh, what we find is that here is the reference solution. 
and the interesting thing that we uh, also found on the way is that if you want to do effective dynamics, uh, there is a paper that showed that effective dynamics of Kuramoto Shivasinski lie on an eight dimensional uh, manifold. And the interesting thing that we found actually is that when we use an autoencoder to uh, process each one of the snapshots in time of the Kuramoto Shivasinski, the autoencoders actually magically saturate after um, eight, and then we use two different autoencoders, and both of them seem to be doing a good job in figuring out this number eight that people, uh, uh, Robinson et al., have seen before to be uh, uh, the truth. And then you see if you do the bad thing, you use a POD or another uh, compressing uh, thing, um, uh, you may be uh, uh, you may be off this magic number of eight. And so you have to be careful. How do you go to the latent space? Now, how well the LED works. So here's how the latent space is evolving. And here is what the LED does. You see that we don't get a one to one correspondence. But if you look at the phase space of the two derivatives, the first and the second derivative of the U, you find out that you're actually doing a pretty good job. And uh, the, the interesting thing is to look at the speed up that you may get. So if you stay only uh, on the latent space, you can have a hundred uh, factor of, of, of speed up. Um, so you don't actually need to ever go back to, um, to, the, to the full space if you are doing the right uh, compression. That's what this message is. But you can also place uh, with the speed up and you have some minor improvement on the, uh, on the error. Um, we tried it also in a cylinder. Um, this is flow Reynolds number of 100. And then we found actually that uh, we are able to do a pretty good prediction. Uh, we get a speed up of a factor of, of, of 100. Uh, we find actually much better uh, convergence in terms of the error. And not only we get convergence in terms of the error of the vorticity, but if you look at quantities like the drug, you can do a simulation 100 times faster. And uh, you can capture the drug to within 4%. But of course, this is Reynolds number of 100. And a lot of people say, here, I've done Reynolds number of 100. The rest is trivial. Well, the rest is not trivial. Because at least for us, when we do Reynolds number of 1,000, we don't find that we have such good uh, error with this LED. We actually stop uh, and we have uh, things like 20% of the error. Um, and, and, and what we figure out, actually, is not only the autoencoder um, that you're using, but also what are the points that you're using in order to do the compression. So we know that vorticity happens around the surface of the cylinder. So what we learn from that is actually that when you pick or give higher weight in your autoencoder to points where the physics are dominant, that's when the autoencoder starts to behave um, uh, uh, better. Um, uh, we applied this also in, in, in molecular system. It's a very general framework. Uh, so here is the alanine dipeptide. This is a phase diagram of alanine dipeptide. Um, and then if you do a molecular simulation, you uh, find that you are, uh, this is the phase space that the molecular dynamics can simulate. Um, and then what you can do is you can apply the LED. And then we're using uh, a latent space of one dimension. Uh, and, and then what the LED gives you, actually, you see that you get a uh, latent space um, that looks like a, a free energy type of a projection that has various minima. And indeed, these various minima, they correspond to the different places where the uh, molecular dynamic uh, simulations have been spending their time. At the same time, uh, I always want to mention that for good results, you also have bad results. The bad result is that we capture some areas, but some other areas that they were not in the, in the, the training set, uh, and we never visited this part of the domain. We are not able to capture, as for example, this area AEL. We don't capture it very well. C7, um, you can say C7 AEX, as we call it, we are pretty much uh, okay. Uh, but there is a lot of promise. Uh, we're working on, on this thing, and, and we hope to have uh, uh, better results and better theory on, on the future. Now, one more thing, one more recent work is about learning to predict not only not faster, but try to predict better. And I will explain what I mean that. But first, I'd like to tell you um, that uh, prediction is like control. Uh, so better prediction means control prediction to achieve your goals under certain uh, uh, energy or cost constraints. So let me introduce you to uh, the topic of control. And the idea here is that I'm trying to combine scientific computing and multi-agent reinforcement learning. 
what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is uh, the situation where you have some kind of a behavior of an agent, um, a human, a computer, whatever you want, uh, where um, the, the agent is performing a, uh, an action. Uh, it receives a stimulus and a reward from the environment. And then um, as the reward is accumulating, then the agent is conditioned to a particular behavior. One of the pioneers of that was actually here at Harvard, was um, uh, a person called Buru Skinner. So, so you see that the pigeons actually learn, uh, they reinforce the particular behavior. And, and the idea was actually to put pigeons in time, inside rockets, and, and then you have some windows there, and then the pigeons, they look out, and then whenever they see a particular landscape, then they will uh, punch a button, and then a bomb will fall out and, and, uh, uh, and, and then hit the target. And, and, and this was the reason behind this work. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, uh, article, uh, Pigeon Pilots, that I would recommend, because it shows you some of the pioneering works in reinforcement learning, but with, with animals. Of course, reinforcement learning has been very popular in um, in, in, in games. Um, uh, so all these successes of artificial intelligence, there's a lot of reinforcement learning behind. So what's reinforcement learning? Uh, reinforcement learning is that you basically, if you remember when I do stochastic optimization, I had a covariance matrix that I am adapting. Well, again, you're adapting, uh, you have a Gaussian probability distribution with a mean and a covariance if you like, but now the way you update the mean and the covariance is by playing again a game where you're observing states. The states are going through a particular uh, interpolator. Here we have a recurrent neural network that has weights, and then the weights are changed by observing the expectation of the long-term reward of what you, um, uh, of, 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 of what you do. So you basically have an expectation condition or something that we call a policy. The policy has the weights, the weights are being changed. And as you are acting, you have this loop that tells you how to change the, the weights in order to maximize your, your reward. Um, why is this good for control? Um, uh, in, in flow control, um, I always found fascinating that you have the governing equations, but usually things that you are controlling with, let's say deformations on the surface, they don't necessarily appear in an explicit way into the cost function that you want to control. So, for example, if you want to control the drug, you have the Navier-Stokes equations, and even if you can add the controller on the Navier-Stokes equations, for the drug is a byproduct, uh, so it's not so trivial to do um, uh, derivatives, or at least myself, I didn't know how to do it well. So I found that reinforcement learning may overcome some of these uh, challenges. Now, reinforcement learning has its challenges itself. The idea is that you play many, many, many games in order to figure out finally what is the right policy. And one of the popular techniques that people do in reinforcement learning is something called off-policy uh, learning. Uh, the idea of, of, of policy learning is that as you try right now to, uh, to make a policy about what you do, you look at what you have done in the past, and then you say, which one of the experiences I have in the past are most relevant for me to achieve a goal uh, uh, now. So this experience replay, and, and one of the notorious things about uh, experience replay is that it is uh, relatively unstable. Uh, and people have stand, spent a lot of time trying to stabilize uh, this process. And uh, actually, when we looked at it, we found out that the key thing was that basically experience replay amounts to important sampling. So what do we mean by that? Again, here is the policy that you're looking for in order to maximize your uh, reward. And then uh, what you do is uh, you are collecting experiences. And at some point, you want to bring back some of these experiences to inform the action that the agent uh, is taking. So uh, again, there is this instability that I mentioned. And, and the way to to see this is that you're taking an expectation in terms of one policy, but then you want to decide that you want to change the expectation. You're going to change the expectation in terms of another policy. So this is the uh, experiences that you have. 
So the policy to update and the old policy that you're using, sometimes they are, may not be uh, at the same location, so you may blow up. And also the two probability distributions between the uh, online policy and the old policy, they may be very dissimilar. And as you know, in important sampling, it's uh, when you do important sampling, if the two probability distributions are not similar, you are off. So we spent uh, some time and, and with my student Guido Novati now works in DeepMind, we came up with this algorithm, remember and forget experience replay, where we try to fix uh, these two things. Now, um, we were very surprised actually, the, the story here is very different than doing neural nets and taking TensorFlow and running. If you take um, algorithms that you find on the internet and you apply them in fluid mechanics problems, here's a fluid mechanic problem, we're trying to control a disk behind a cylinder. We never found any of these algorithms to work. And also we were very surprised that when we took our algorithm and we compared with reinforcement learning algorithms that people use to do Mujoko and all these games that they do, we were much better in terms of reward. So there are some accommodations that you need to do, but um, so there is, it's important to work on, this, uh, uh, on these topics. So one of the things we did is, uh, is we worked, we were very interested to use reinforcement learning to study schooling. So schooling is when fish swim together, there is different ideas that uh, the school uh, may have different benefits. Uh, now, when you do it in the, when you observe it in the, in the lab, the fish, they're doing something themselves. But now when you go to the computer and you put some swimmers and you give them an initial uh, velocity, if you don't do adaptive control, then what happens is the swimmers, because of the flow structure interaction, they're going to start to collide. So before we are able to study schooling, we have to make these guys to school. Of course, it's easy to make them school by forgetting about Navier-Stokes equations and putting some rules. But if you put Navier-Stokes equations and you do flow structure interaction, it's a very difficult uh, control problem. So we solve this uh, problem by doing reinforcement learning. We have a swimmer that observes certain states. I'm not gonna uh, go and discuss that. And then uh, observe has different actions and receives a reward. We can decide on different rewards. So here the reward for this swimmer was, uh, we asked the swimmer to swim right behind um, the, other, um, the other fish. And then when we saw that, when we did that, we found actually that the uh, swimmer that was in the wake were using much less energy than the swimmer in the front. So we said, okay, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, uh, what if we ask actually the, uh, the, the swimmer, uh, so it was about 12% better, what if we ask the swimmer to optimize for efficiency? Uh, so we got a, a, another pattern, which is wonderful because we found a very beautiful ballet between vortices and the head of the swimmer, how it intercepts vortices so to gain energy uh, from them. And we got actually a pretty good efficiency of about a gain of about 28%. Uh, uh, we applied this thing in, in, uh, in 3D um, uh, with different uh, configurations. So again, these are big simulations using wavelet adapted grids, vortex methods, which are the things that I was doing, um, viscous vortex methods that are accurate and, and um, using uh, control through uh, reinforcement uh, learning. And again, um, this is a simulation that we are driving to where here I have 300 fish. So again, we're going to big supercomputers again. Uh, and here they have not learned anything. So they're swimming uh, left and right. Uh, but we hope to add um, some uh, learning algorithms to them to make them uh, school. And also here is also talking about the blood. We didn't forget the blood. So here is a a bacteria that learns uh, through a magnetic field to travel in certain places and to target uh, different cells. So now all this is good for control, but how about for prediction? Um, so now there is a relationship between prediction and control, and this relationship is the following. Um, usually when we have a system, what we do is we, uh, we can break um, the unknown into things that we can observe. We can resolve on a grid, a U bar, and things we cannot observe on a grid, a U prime. And then uh, when you do this decomposition, uh, this is Reynolds averaging for Navier-Stokes, um, you get something like that where you have to come up with a model uh, that is in terms of the average quantities, uh, and then you have to supply this model in order to do provide a closure to the equation. So it's a pretty 
general thing. It can happen to LES. It can be coarse grain molecular dynamics. So inspired from control, um, I, I thought, what if we use reinforcement learning to do that? Uh, what if I learn uh, the closure models uh, using uh, reinforcement learning? There is a lot of work that has been done about supervised, supervised learning and, 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 um, and uh, turbulence modeling. I will not refer to that. Uh, I think there are certain advantages of the reinforcement learning. First of all, reinforcement learning, the way we use it in the multi-agent way is very much data efficient. So I will explain what I mean by that. So you're having a grid and on the grid, you're solving equations. Uh, so you can take your Navier stocks, you solve them on the grid. And at the same time, you can disperse on the grid agents. And now these agents, you can have one-to-one -one with the grid and they can learn now how to behave so that they provide closures for the equations that are being solved uh, on the grid. Um, so this is the scientific uh, multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning. Um, we have, um, published uh, this work uh, about a couple of years ago uh, to do turbulence modeling uh, using uh, MARL. And, and I'll show you a little bit. Um, okay, you all know what homogeneous. So here's, the, here's what we do. So here is a homogeneous uh, turbulence. And what we are asking uh, is we are asking that we have agents throughout the domain. Uh, now the agents, they have some local states. You can imagine that if I had one agent and a big policy, and then I was asking for states to be my whole domain, then let's say even if I do a 32 cube grid uh, and I observe every velocity, I would have three times 32 to the cube states. And that's a lot. Uh, it would be impossible to, to run reinforcement learning, at least with the resources we have. So instead we said, what if I have some global um, states that I can get the uh, uh, energy, for example, of, of my system and look at the Fourier modes. And what if I look at the invariance of my um, gradient tensor and the Laplacian tensor? So the, the states that you choose actually make it or break it. And then in the end, what the agent learns, it learns this turbulence coefficient. And the reward is how do you recover things that you do uh, from a DNS? So, um, so here are some results. Um, so there are different ways that we have our policy, different rewards. Focus on the blue points uh, for a moment, the blue lines. Uh, so here I have trained my uh, reinforcement learning on this uh, Ari Lambda, uh, 65, 140, 163. And then you can see that I go and I try to predict in between, but I also go and I try to predict far away to extrapolate into things that were not within this 163. So 190 and 205 were way beyond uh, that. And what you see from this blue policy, <clears throat> which is basically using a reward that depends on the energy spectra, is pretty much uh, recovering um, the, um, the black line on the energy spectrum. You see here how the dynamics Magorinsky model and the standards Magorinsky that are known to be, to be relatively well, they don't perform as well as this blue uh, policy is behaving. The yellow one is we said, what if I train on only one Reynolds number, how good I am in all the other Reynolds numbers. So you see that you're still doing better than standard uh, Smagorinsky. And the red one, uh, this is a case where, for example, there is failure because here the reward was observing the Germano identity. And then we found that this reward actually was not very good to give you uh, recapturing of, of the energy. Um, more recent work uh, that I will not uh, elaborate it today. This was work with uh, Jane Bai that was recently appeared in Nature uh, Communications. Um, I will not tell you about the states of and the actions so that we stayed uh, we stay um, within uh, the time. Uh, but what? Um, let me go to uh, the the results. Um, so so what I had is I train um, my um, multi-agent reinforcement uh, uh, learning algorithm uh, by receiving um, uh, some estimates of, the, of certain quantities in the near wall region. And, and then what I'm doing is I am acting by tuning the, uh, the shear stresses that I are applying on, 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 my, on, my, on my turbulent uh, channel flow. And, and then, um, so here is the test that I did. So we tested the, we trained the algorithm up to Reynolds number of uh, 10 to the four, Ari Tau. And then we tried to see how well does it extrapolate. Uh, we found that it's able to capture uh, the mean um, 
uh, shear velocity pretty well and we know what is the correct thing because we know the pressure gradients uh, that we have uh, in, in the flow and and this is the recovery on the different places in the domain of the law of the wall the law of the wall is what it should have recovered and you see how well it recovers over a wide range of re uh, tau and then we took training that has been done in a turbulent channel flow and we applied it in a turbulent boundary layer and then we were very happy to see that we can actually recover experimental results of the um, uh, friction coefficient without retraining for a turbulent uh, boundary layer. So I have presented you some alloys of scientific computing and machine learning. Um, there can be data uh, and equation driven. Um, they are trying to overcome uh, certain computational barriers and certain things that we know about closures. Um, uh, nothing is perfect in what we do. Uh, we would like to have uh, more theory. Uh, we are exploring uh, different uh, ideas uh, between uh, advanced machine learning algorithms and how they play together with things that we do in scientific computing. And uh, we are investigating a, a whole bunch of, um, of different applications. Uh, it's an exciting time. I, I would like to insist that uh, neither uh, scientific computing alone, I think, uh, can go on ignoring AI, and I think AI cannot go alone with, uh, on at least on some of the problems we tackle with scientific computing by ignoring all these other things that we have developed over the years. And in particular, I'd like to argue that physics knowledge is extremely important for reinforcement learning. If you don't pick the correct states, you're never going to get the algorithm to work. I can show you an infinite amount of wrong results because we didn't pick uh, uh, the, the right states. Um, I'd like to thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for the actually the beautiful talk. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it was the one of the most beautiful talk I ever seen, actually. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, let's have a uh, Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please, um, I guess, unmute yourself and then speak direct, um, ask directly. Um, um, to start, I guess I can ask questions and um, as you have uh, briefly mentioned you know you know you know the training the new uh, the reinforcement learning or the uh, other types of neural nets in your um, various projects you have introduced today probably you haven't show all the you know struggles of the training the neural net um because that's one of the real bottleneck how do you usually uh, you know the resolve those those struggles um so so for the struggles so for example i can tell you on the reinforcement learning um yeah. you saw that in the turbulence modeling uh of the homogeneous turbulence um maybe i can share again my screen let me share my screen yeah yeah uh and let me go to my keynote um so if if i go back here uh, you will see that the states, for example, that I picked for my um, uh, reinforcement learning uh, in the homogeneous uh, turbulence, they're not quite obvious. So first of all, OK, I don't pick my velocity field, uh, but then I go and I find the uh, gradient tensor and the Laplacian, and then I, 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 I look at the invariance of these tensors. And um, if I had gone and I had picked just velocity fields, this algorithm doesn't work. I could never, we could never get it to produce anything. It would be lost in some landscape that was very strange. Now, these invariants are pretty good because um, we, you can think about it later, because if you are in homogeneous and isotropic uh, turbulence, these are the invariants that, that you should try to, uh, um, to, 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 to maintain. Um, also, uh, getting the total dissipation is something that you would like to have. And then we played around with the energy. And then we said, what if I look at the different Fourier components of the energy and let me collect a few of them as states? So it was a trial and error. And, and there is a you're basically trying to find the manifold of, of, of where your actions here, the actions were just this coefficient of the Smagorinsky model. We, 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 we played with all sorts of different um uh, Spagorinsky models but finally we decided to stick with that so there was only one action that you have here every agent has a local action and and, and and goes to its neighbors but all these things are very closely linked so so your question is 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 very deep very fundamental and i think unless we find a, a clever 
machine learning based way of finding spaces where these algorithms can be effective, I, I still maintain that the best bet that we have at the moment is physical understanding about the things that we try to do. And, and these are the things that can help us to figure out, at least for reinforcement learning, what are the states and, and the actions uh, that I uh, try to do. I uh, also, in the case of the LED, um, uh, yes, okay, my autoencoders, they are nice and they bring me down to this uh, reduced order space. Um, but to me, they seem very artificial. Is there, for me, it would be very interesting if I could figure out um, causal latent variables, for example, the things that are critical for a flow and project on these um, dimensions in order to do my LED. Maybe my error will be reduced, reduced even more. Um, so I'm a big proponent of, of, uh, of, of keeping to teach people physics and, and numerics, uh, along with machine learning. Machine learning is an amazing set of tools that makes you think different. Of course, of course. Okay, so yeah, even though the, uh, well, okay, so the impression I got from your answer is that even though you use the physics, well, the physics is guiding your trial and errors. And then that's right. Um, and That's the trial right. and error is is unavoidable, but the, the there is there, there are different things that we are thinking about about how yeah. to uh, find uh, optimal um, optimal spaces and optimal landscapes, uh, but uh, automatically uh, in an automated fashion and uh, in a machine learning fashion, but. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big talk. That's another big talk about that. Yeah. Maybe when I talk again about UQ, I'll talk about that because it involves some kind of Bayesian inference that, that we are using for that. I see. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Any other question from audience? Don't be shy. I hear something. I'll try to answer. <laughs> Yeah, Amit. Okay, hi. Hi, hi Petros. Uh, this is Amit. Amit. So I am interested in the example of alanine dipeptide that you showed. And I was wondering, so you are essentially now able to sample, so to say, a free energy landscape because you were able to force in the system. And uh, so I wonder if you did use any sampling method to explore this coarse grain space because you were showing that um, the, the the model was unable to explore um, some high energy region. So is it possible to sort of couple this with some sampling method? And have you done that? Do you see any no. problems in doing that? No, no. But uh, actually, it would be uh, very interesting to try to use some of the techniques like metadynamics and all these kind of things that people have done in order yeah. to escape uh, low order uh, regions together with this framework. I think there is a, a very broad array of possibilities of how um, once you are down at this Latin space to start to use techniques that people have been using in molecular dynamics and other places to try to how, how do you evolve in the Latin space. At the moment I was doing it in a very mundane way by using recurrent neural nets, but nothing tells me that it should be recurrent neural nets. It can be something else. Um, uh, so again, this LED paper came out uh, about uh, two weeks ago after being <laughs> sent around for two years, um, and, and we are trying to, to build on it. Okay. And I actually have a related question um, after you course screen the system, I know you showed a lot of results about uh, fluid dynamics, but for an atomic system, after you course screen, I wonder if it is possible to learn the dynamics. And if you have done that, um, like learn the dynamics in the course screen variable space, and then once you evolve the system for a certain amount of time, you fold it back to the original uh, configuration space in this way, one can envision um, uh, a way to speed up molecular dynamics, but automatically doing uh, course graining also. Yes, that's that's uh, that's another topic of, of future work. At the moment, we have stayed we have stayed only in the coarse grain uh, space, and 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 since we didn't we didn't do the thing of going back and forth and 
and replacing the molecular dynamics. But this is actually something that that uh, that we are working on uh, at the moment. The idea is to to try to do very long time uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations by by building that. But we have not done that yet. Okay. Yeah, we are trying to do something similar here uh, at the lab, and for, perhaps we can talk about it later. So I will be when... very happy to to exchange. Uh, sure, be happy to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, there's another uh, the question in Q&A. Uh, Sean asked, oh, he said, a very nice talk. Um, Thank you. He asked, what's your viewpoint in thinking physics-informed neural networks for modeling complex dynamics? Uh, it is also a very hot topic in uh, scientific machine learning. Okay, I have an answer because I actually happened to work in physics-informed neural nets a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what is my experience with that. <laughs> Uh, so I have some slides uh, awesome. on that. Uh, so I, I'll show you what is my experience with physics in form uh, neural nets. Actually, I call it learning to interpolate. Um, so learning to interpolate means that you have some equations, and then uh, here is um, what I had, um, what I can get. And now I'm not talking about extrapolating. I'm talking about. Petros, are, are you sharing the screen? Ah, now? okay. So we are not. We are not. We are not seeing. Share, share, you can see it now. So yeah, yeah, so that's what I call learning to interpolate. Um, so you have the neural networks for, for PDEs, and then the idea here is that you're using some, some points, X and T, that's the mm -hmm. domain. Remember the Kuramoto Sivasinski I was showing you earlier. Uh, and then this is the, um, uh, the loss function that the, um, this, these techniques uh, have. Now, uh, these techniques, I first encountered them back in 1998. There is this paper by uh, Lagaris and Likas and Kotiadis that actually described and introduced this method. Uh, and this was the time I was playing with neural nets. So I tried uh, this method and I will show you what are the results I got back then. And that's the same results that I get back now. But of course, um, uh, people uh, don't know Lagaris and, and Likas and Kotiadis so much. They come from an obscure university in Ioannina. People know this paper, and this paper actually uh, mentions uh, the paper of uh, Lagaris. Uh, it's reference uh, uh, 15, uh, where they actually say similar ideas uh, have existed. I think it's the same ideas. I think what is interesting in the new paper um, of the 2019 is that you use TensorFlow, and, and then uh, you're doing different things. So my experience is the following, um, that here is the Kuramoto Sivasinski again. And now what I do is I take uh, different um, uh, neural networks and I'm using uh, different epochs and different seeds and, and so on and so forth. And what you find is that I increase the network size and I'm varying the seed. And I find that uh, uh, the so-called pins, um, they converge to the exact solution. Now, this is the kuramoto sivasinski equation with these parameters. Now I change the parameters to the kuramoto sivasinski Maybe I make it a little bit more challenging, and, and I never got it to work. Um, so if you have, uh, if the problem starts to become more stiff um, and you're looking into longer times, uh, at least myself, we find that the things, um, they are, uh, they don't converge. And not only that, if you look at the um, computational intensity, um, this is, there's two things to observe here. So here's the number of parameters that you may have. Uh, on a, using a, a finite difference uh, scheme, so you get your classical one over n. And here you can do a whole bunch of different samples. It's interesting that in some cases you get some samples actually that they give you the correct solution. But if you do a, a spectrum of solutions, as you should be doing, uh, because it's a stochastic method, you find that you're all over the place. And, and the mean convergence rate is, is like that. So, of course, if I show you these results, one, two, and this one, you will say, okay, that's that's really good. But that's not really good when you change initial conditions and, and parameters. And the other thing that's for me the big difference is that these things, when you trade them, they cost you a million times more than uh, finite differences. Um, I think there are merits to, to, to these techniques um, uh, that are, are worth investigating, uh, but um, at least uh, there is, uh, this is my uh, experience uh, with this um, with this method. I'm happy to answer questions. Very good, very good. 
Um, is there any other question? Okay, if not, let's um, conclude the talk. Let's thank our speaker uh, for the wonderful talk and, and the beautiful. Thank you for talk. having me. Yeah, and for all the questions. Yeah, and thank and and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, with that, let's um, end the uh, the webinar talk today. Okay, let me push the stop button. To